Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our lecture for April in our spring series for um, Neuroscience 388, Current Issues in Neuroscience. Um, today, we're delighted to have Dr. Ziv Ben-Zion, um, who's visiting us here from Yale, virtually from Yale University. Dr. Ben-Zion um, started out in my three favorite topics, biology, psychology, and neuroscience at Tel Aviv University. And then he went on to get his neuroscience degree, um, his PhD, also at Tel Aviv University, and he completed that in 2020. And currently, he's a Fulbright Scholar at Yale University, um, kind of looking at the intersection of two laboratories that we admire and um, in integrating the work between those two laboratories. So I will let him share more about his work um, as he talks to us about um, how to predict and address and study um, impacts of PTSD. And Dr. Um, Benzion, please repeat your title, which I don't have on the screen right now. And um, thank you very much for being here today with us. Thank you very much, Susan, uh, for the kind introduction, and also Sarah for inviting me. Uh, I will share my screen just to make sure that you see it. Yes, looks great. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, so yeah, um, the title of my talk today is going to be Neurocognitive Moderators of PTSD Symptom Trajectories. A little bit complicated, but it will become more clear. Um, yeah, I'm currently Fulbright postdoc at Yale, uh, as you mentioned, and I'm very happy to be with you today virtually. And I hope that in the near future, I could also come physically and then have lunch with you and do the whole thing like we used to be before COVID. Um, so today I'm gonna talk to you mainly about results from my PhD work, uh, which was done at Tel Aviv University between 2016 and 2020. Uh, and the outline is as follows. I'm gonna start with the general introduction and the motivation for the study that we've conducted, uh, followed by the research goal and specific objectives that we had in mind. I'll briefly describe the methods and study design. And uh, I think the interesting part will be to go over the results that we currently have. Uh, we're still working on some more results, but so far I've published several papers uh, with the current results that we have. And I will focus on what you see here in bold on the neurobehavioral mechanisms of PTSD, specifically about the role of the positive and negative balance systems in the brain in the context of uh, post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. Uh, and I'll conclude by a little bit of future direction, both to what is being done at Tel Aviv University and my old lab and what I'm doing uh, here at Yale together with uh, Professor Levy and Professor Paz Rotem. Uh, please feel free to stop me at any time for questions, especially if it's something that you don't understand. So don't be shy, you don't have to wait. And of course, if it's more general questions and discussion, I'll be happy uh, to stay as much as possible after the lecture and discuss with you. Uh, and also I didn't mention, I'll go back to the first slide. You have my email here. Uh, feel free to contact me at any time. I'm always happy uh, to hear new thoughts and ideas. Okay, so let's start with a little bit of background. What is it post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD? We hear about this a lot, but let's just make sure we all uh, know what we're talking about. So, the definition of PTSD according to the DSM-5, which is the most updated version of, uh, let's say, the mental health diagnostic tool, uh, PTSD is defined by four different symptom clusters. In order to, be, to have a diagnosis of PTSD, you have to have enough symptoms in each one of these clusters. Uh, the first one is intrusion, often called re-experiencing. It's mainly flashback of the traumatic events, intrusive thoughts that don't leave you alone. Uh, second cluster is avoidance. It's referring both to physical avoidance, so avoidance from going back to the same place where the accident or the traumatic event happened, and also about mental avoidance, which is more 
trying not to think about it, not to remember what happened and stuff like that. The third cluster is hyperarousal symptoms, which is referring to hypervigilance, this feeling that you always need to be on guard and ready for any kind of emergency or traumatic thing that will happen again in the near future. And finally, a more general symptom cluster uh, talks about negative alternations in mood and cognition. And here we can see more symptoms that are also common in anxiety and depression, uh, kind of uh, not being able to feel positive emotions compared to before the accident. So suddenly you do the same activities you used to do. Let's say I enjoy playing tennis. And after the accident, I go and play tennis and I feel less rewarded by that, less enjoying in meeting people and stuff like that. Also depression, uh, many, many symptoms that are kind of even outside of the scope of the actual uh, traumatic event. Now, uh, the interesting thing, and some of you might have heard about it in the recent years in the psychiatry, especially in the research world, there's kind of a shift in our focus. Uh, for a lot of time, people focused on the symptoms, like I described right now about the symptoms of PTSD. Uh, but in recent years, people are starting to investigate more the processes underlying the symptoms. For example, you can see the processes I've mentioned here. Let's say some kind of alternation or change in the threat detection can cause hyperarousal symptoms, or some kind of change in memory processes can cause intrusive symptoms. I always like to give a simple example uh, about the difference between a symptom and a process or a mechanism. So let's say I have a headache and I go to the doctor. So I report that I have a headache and this is the symptom that I want to solve. But as a doctor, uh, I need to know what, what is this headache com coming from. Uh, there could be one million reasons, right? It could be just that I didn't sleep well at night and then the doctor should just tell me, go to sleep. Uh, or it could be something more severe, uh, let's say brain tumor or something like that. And then I need to go to surgery and solve that. So the same symptom uh, can be actually could be stemming from different things. So kind of parallel to that, we're trying to think that if we can target these processes in PTSD, but in general, in different psychiatric disorder, maybe by targeting these processes, we could solve the symptoms, not just by directly uh, targeting the symptoms themselves. Because also in psychiatry, as I mentioned, a lot of symptoms are not specific to one disorder, but rather kind of overlapping different disorders. Just to give you a kind of a more uh, personal example, this is a quote uh, by one of our participants in the study that I will describe you um, that underwent a car accident. And in, this is this quote saying, I'm a different person since the accident. It changed my life for the worst. Something happened to me and it changed me. I can't get it out of my head. So that is kind of giving you the sense what often happens in PTSD. It's people that usually had a normative life. I mean, of course, everyone has his problems even before no one comes completely healthy. But usually people that had, you know, were functioning, had relationships, had a workplace, everything. And after the traumatic event, kind of everything collapses and they lose their relationships, they lose their workplace, they lose the ability to enjoy things, their kind of, uh, you know, connection with the family, everything. So it's very important it's one of the only disorders that we can actually separate the, the beginning of, of the disorder, which is the traumatic event, and we can compare everything to what happened before the event. So just, this is just to give you a sense uh, of what we're talking about. So of course, uh, it's a very popular and important topic, I think, and I'll share some statistics with you. Uh, this is talking about worldwide. So over 70% of the people all over the world were experienced at least one traumatic event during their lifetime. And we even have uh, over 30% which will experience four or more traumatic events. Um, unfortunately, I don't need to give example of how important it is. I mean, I, I gave talks about post-trauma uh, as a consequence of COVID. Now we have the situation of Russia and Ukraine. And even if I will look at the last two weeks, um, just in Israel, where I'm originally from, and in the States. I'm sure we've all heard about the terror attack in Tel Aviv that happened about two weeks ago, and the terror attack in, uh, in the subway, and 
New York City and Brooklyn also several days ago. So unfortunately, we live in a world with a lot of traumatic events and everybody could be exposed to a traumatic event of you know, some type or another. Uh, so I believe these statistics is even increasing and more and more people experience more and more traumatic events in their lifetimes. But I'll give you some good news. So not everybody who experienced a traumatic event develop this chronic disorder, PTSD. And more than that, most people recover from so if I'm talking about the symptom trajectories, this is a study from about a decade ago that looked at 1,000 people uh, right after trauma, measuring their symptoms of PTSD, starting from 10 days and up to 14 months. Um, and if we look at the average, we see a general decrease in symptoms over time. But of course, we're not interested in the average. We are interested in the individual level trying to kind of look if there are different trajectories. And indeed, using some more advanced uh, statistical uh, models, we can identify uh, three different trajectories. You can see uh, here, I put a black line on the one month time point because currently PTSD can only be diagnosed uh, at one month after the traumatic event and not before. Before, if you experience the same symptoms, it's referred to as acute stress disorder or ASD. And only if it, the symptoms proceed for over a month, then you get the PTSD diagnosis. And what you can see here is out of 1,000 people that displayed high symptoms in the beginning, in the first month after trauma, we can see that over half of the participants, 56%, show kind of a very rapid decrease or remission in symptoms, remaining with very low symptoms. We have around quarter of the participant, 27%, that also show remission, but this remission is slower and also partial. Uh, and finally, we have the group, which we call non-remitting uh, PTSD or chronic PTSD. And you can see even those individuals show some decrease over time, but it's very minor and they still remain with very, very high symptoms. So the, of course the y-axis is the symptom severity and the x-axis is the time. And this finding has been replicating since then in many different studies. This is the general uh, trajectories of PTSD as we know. Of course, each individual is different and this is just uh, try to classify the trajectories. And one last thing I want to tell you that this time point of a year or even a bit over a year, 14 months, is known to be clinically stable. What do I mean? I mean that people that develop PTSD at this point, this red group of 17%. It means that over 90% of them will not show recovery afterwards, meaning they will stay with the chronic disorder for years and years and maybe throughout the whole lifetime. Uh, and similarly, people that recovered will, will usually not show kind of uh, occurrence of PTSD afterwards, even though there are some cases, it's called late onset PTSD, but again, it's very marginal. Uh, I think around 90% of the people here stay in the same situation. Either they stay with PTSD or if they recover, they, re they stay without PTSD. Excuse me, can you hear me? Yeah. I just moved a tiny bit away from the microphone, just the last couple of sentences. So um, I just wanted to let you know. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's now you Yes, perfect. Yes. Cool, so I'll just, I'll just, uh, repeat the last two sentences. So I said that those three trajectories, uh, the time point of 14 months is a stable time point, meaning that most of the people that recovered would stay without chronic PTSD, whereas people that stayed with the chronic disorder will usually stay with it and would not recover. And unfortunately, they will stay with the disorder for years and years and sometimes even for a lifetime. As you probably know, there are some veterans that could be 60 or 70 years old today. They still carry their trauma from when they were 18. And there are two uh, kind of very relevant questions that still, with all the research that is being done, still remain unsolved. One is who will develop chronic PTSD and who will recover? Meaning if I look at people at one month after trauma and they all have high symptoms, how would I know who will, be belong, who will belong to the green line, the blue line, the red line? How can I predict it? 
And the second question is maybe even more interesting, is what are the neuro, uh, neurocognitive, meaning neural, like brain mechanisms or cognitive mechanisms that underlie those three different trajectories? What changes in the brain or in our cognition or in both of them that actually determines who will develop PTSD and who will recover and at what pace they will recover? So most studies uh, to date that studied PTSD, um, I mean, a lot of studies is, is focused on this topic and a lot of money has been dedicated to research, but there are several main problems which I'll briefly tell you. So most studies are what we call cross-sectional studies, meaning they were only conducted at one time point, taking a group, group of people with PTSD and a group of people without PTSD and um, looking at them at one time point. Most of them also looked at one domain, let's say cognitive functioning or maybe brain structure or maybe brain function, but not at several domains together. Uh, the assessment was done in the chronic stage, meaning people that already have PTSD for five years or 10 years, let's say. And this is not the initial stage or the acute stage that I showed you of one year after trauma, which actually determines if you will develop a disorder or not. So we don't really know what happens right after trauma. It's more what happens after five years being with PTSD. Uh, most studies use single outcome measure to measure PTSD symptoms and severity. A lot of times is self-report questionnaires, which has their own limitations. For example, the person not, use, not always want to exactly uh, say what he or she feels or experiencing. Uh, and last but not least, most of the therapies for PTSD uh, were developed without specific neural or cognitive targets. That is, for example, psychological treatments are mostly exposure-based, cognitive behavioral therapy based on theories from the 80s, and medications are usually from the family of the SSRI, uh, working on serotonin neurotransmitter, and again, these medications are not specific for PTSD. They were developed initially for depression, uh, some for anxiety, and now uh, they are given to people with PTSD, uh, kind of hoping that it will work. It works for some, but doesn't work for others, and we don't really know why. So in my PhD study, uh, we try to kind of overcome all these gaps and limitations uh, by conducting a longitudinal, longitudinal multimodal study with repeated assessments specifically in the first year after trauma, using various measure, measures to kind of capture PTSD. So both self-report and um, clinical interviews with clinicians, and on, not only looking at PTSD, but also at comorbidities such as depression, anxiety, um, with the ultimate goal of actually discover some kind of targets and their temporal sequence that could help us develop better treatments uh, for this very debilitating disorder. So the overall research goal uh, of my PhD study, which I'll describe in a second, was indeed to uncover neurocognitive moderators of PTSD symptom trajectories. And I hope now this title of my talk is more clear after this introduction. And specifically, we use clinical assessment, as I said, self-reports, demographic variables, brain structure, brain function, and cognitive functioning, all of them, to, all of them together uh, to kind of try to understand what happens in PTSD. So this is the study design that we had. Um, the study, as you can see, took a little bit over five years, starting January 2015, ending in March 2020, right before COVID. We're lucky, at least in this sense. Um, what we did is the screening procedure, which I'll describe in the next slide. Uh, my lab was actually located in a hospital in Tel Aviv, in the center of Tel Aviv, in Israel. Uh, and we worked together with the emergency department. We called participants that arrived to the emergency department following any kind of trauma exposure, mostly motor vehicle accidents, but also some participants experience sexual assault, terror attacks, uh, physical assaults, and so on. We contact them between 10 to 14 days after the trauma uh, via telephone interview, so not exactly in the emergency room. Uh, and 
what we tried is to find participants or individuals which would first be willing to participate in a study, uh, second, that experienced high PTSD symptoms, as I showed you before, because ultimately we want to have people that recover, but also people that won't recover, so we could study the difference, and people that could also uh, do an MRI scan. As some of you might know, there are several limitations that can prevent you from doing an MRI scan, so we also had to check that. Um, after all the screening, if a participant was willing and able to participate and met the inclusion criteria, we performed clinical, cognitive, and neural assessments uh, at three different time points. One month after the traumatic event, after the ER admission, six months after that, and 14 months, which is a little bit over a year after the trauma. Um, you can see the numbers that we have. So we had 171 participants enrolled in the study uh, at one month after trauma that underwent all these assessments. And we ended up with 138 out of them, which is quite a high number uh, for studies in general, but specifically for studies in clinical population. As you might uh, you know, hypothesize, of course, people that did not recover from PTSD and kept experiencing symptoms were less likely to come back and our team did an amazing work of kind of trying to still preserve this participant and con convince them to participate in the study. Uh, and yeah, that was, if you want to read more about it, uh, I think it's one of the papers that I've already sent you, but we published a study protocol that's specifying all the, all the different methods. And of course, if you have questions, you can ask me now or afterwards. Um, so I just want to, uh, expand more about the recruitment and screening just to kind of demonstrate to you whoever wants to pursue an academic career or do clinical research, uh, some of the difficulties of recruiting clinical population. So over these five years uh, in this big project, we called around 10,000 uh, different individuals. Out of them, 7,000 answered the phone. Out of them, 4,000 underwent what we call a short phone interview, which was just one page of questions with the main symptoms of PTSD, uh, whoever met them continued, whoever, a lot of people did not meet, meet these symptoms and we just said, thank you and goodbye. They were not eligible to participate. 1,500 underwent what we call a long interview, which is about four pages of more comprehensive definition or diagnosis of PTSD. 700 met all the inclusion criteria out of those 700, which is just 7% of the initial participant, 450 agreed and participated. In the end, 312 came and performed the first clinical evaluation. And then we had people that were uh, not able to do MRI or declined or suddenly had no symptoms or other reasons leading to this 171 participant that I told you about. Uh, if you, we do a rough calculation, from 10,000 people we called, we got a little bit less than 2% of them to actually come and perform all the assessments just at the first time point, I remind you, at one month after trauma. That means that around 10 hours of phone calls were needed in order to bring one participant for just the first MRI scan. Uh, and this is before we even told them that they need to come to us, to come twice more at six months and at 14 months after trauma. Uh, so just kind of to demonstrate uh, what the procedure of recruitment and screening look like. And of course, I didn't do it by myself. I had a great uh, team of between 15 to 20 uh, people that were helping me in this big project. Um, so just a little bit about the assessment. So from the clinical side, uh, we had clinical interviews by clinicians that examined uh, PTSD severity based on the CAPS. CAPS is the current, it's a acronym from the Clinical Administered PTSD Scale. Uh, we use both versions based on the DSM-4, which is the least uh, updated version, and the DSM-5, which is the most updated version, because they have their PTSD definition differs a bit, and we wanted to capture both of them. We use the SCID questionnaire to examine other mental disorder, and we use some self-report questionnaires where participants uh, report on themselves on symptoms of PTSD, anxiety, depression, or just general 
um, general feeling from one to seven, that's the CGI. In the cognitive measures, we use a platform called Web Neuro. It's a computerized battery of tests. Uh, it took between 40 minutes to one hour per participant where they did many, many uh, different simple tasks. And in the end, what we got is uh, Z scores or standardized scores in different domains of cognition, attention, memory, response inhibition, emotional bias, and so on. Um, the more interesting part, at least for me, uh, was the neural assessment. So in the MRI, we conducted both structural MRI, um, which gave us both just the volume and thickness of areas, but also the white matter tracks that connect those areas one to another. Uh, and we had several measures from brain function. We had resting state scan, and we had three different tasks measuring different domains that if you remember, at the beginning of the first slide, I show you different processes. So those tasks were specifically uh, specifically chosen by us to tap those specific domains uh, and try to see what happens in the brain during processing or different processes. Okay. Um, so now I'll share with you the clinical results that we had just so you can see um, this is the 138 participant, those that uh, started the study and also finished it. And you can see here on the Y axis, the CAP score total score, which is a measure of PTSD symptom severity. And on the X axis, you can see time, one, six and 14 months following trauma, which sometimes I will call just in short TP1, TP2 and TP3. Uh, as you can see, there's a lot of variance between individuals. There aren't even two individuals who reacted in the same, the exact same way. Um, if we want to categorize them roughly on those three trajectories that I showed you before, um, or a little bit different, but that was the main idea. So first of all, we had a group that I didn't mention yet. We had a group of 41 participants here in red that we recruited, even though they did not meet uh, the exact PTSD diagnosis at one month after trauma, you see they had a CAP score of under 40. 40 is one of the ways uh, in order to have a PTSD, there are many different ways. Uh, you can either meet criteria of DSM-4, DSM-5, but also another thing, kind of a quick cut of that is often used is a CAP, CAP score, score of 40 or greater. So you can see they, they did not meet this, but they still had significant amount of symptoms or varying amount. Uh, those participants, you can see generally stayed with low symptoms throughout the whole uh, experiment. And most participants, as I told you, started with PTSD diagnosis. Again, you can see they suffer from different severity of symptoms ranging from 40 to over 100. Um, but there is a difference between the green group and the blue group. So all of these participants at one month met the diagnosis of PTSD, but only those which are colored in green here, it's 32 people, have also met PTSD diagnostic criteria at 14 months following trauma, but all of those in blue, 73 participants, uh, we're happy that they recovered. Some of them recovered already at six months, some of them recovered only at 14 months, but the main thing is that by the end point of the study, they did not meet PTSD criteria. Again, you can see there are variants, there's variability between them. Some of them had almost zero symptoms, but some of them had symptoms that are close to 40. Uh, okay. So, you have any questions so far? Uh, anyone have any questions? I just, I just wanted to ask one thing. Um, so I noticed that some people were worse at six months and then were better again at 14 months. I'm just going to ask again, but since you asked now, I just wanted to um, see if you had a comment about that. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. So indeed, you can see that we have a lot of people uh, that got worse at six months and then got better at 14 months. So the point is what we know is that PTSD is a very dynamic state, especially in the first year. So 
We chose three different time points. Uh, one of them is just the first time point you can diagnose PTSD, and the last one is the one which is kind of stable. Uh, but the six months was kind of arbitrary in between. Uh, we wanted to see if we can separate at this time point people recover or not. But actually, we we're also a bit surprised by that, and I think it's an important finding. Some people are getting worse and then getting better. Some of people, the opposite, kind of getting uh, better, but then uh, their symptoms rise again. So uh, I think the main answer here is that there's a lot of individual differences as well as differences in time. I'm sure that if we would, let's say, at a time point of five months and seven months, we'll get also something totally different. Sometimes it even depends on the day, you know, the day, the week. Um, so in order to really capture it, it's very important uh, to do it more dynamically. And actually studies nowadays, uh, also a lot of them use our ability to have smartphones and they ask people to rank, you know, their symptoms or their feeling briefly, but let's say for two weeks every day and kind of getting more of a comprehensive understanding of the dynamics. Okay. Um, again, if you have more questions, feel free uh, to stop me. Uh, it's nicer to talk to people just uh, instead of talking to my computer. So just to know that you are still alive over there. Um, so we had three research objectives overall. I'm gonna focus especially on the third one, but the first uh, objective was just looking at the first time point TP1 one month after trauma and try to classify the different, the group of 171 individuals based on all the measures that we obtained from them. Clinical, cognitive, neural measures of brain structure, brain function. And we published one work uh, in 2020 in translational psychiatry uh, about this multi-domain classification using advanced uh, statistical and computational modeling if you wanna read more about it. The second aim was prediction of PTSD. That is taking all of the data that we have at one month after trauma, the one that I was talking in the first objective, but now also trying to, based on that multi-domain data, try to predict the future outcome. So actually we know who developed PTSD and who recover and how did they recover? And we try to see if we can use just this very initial one month uh, data that we have on them of different measure to predict who will develop PTSD, who will recover and maybe even the different severity. Um, so far we've published four articles uh, regarding that. The ones in bold are the ones that I think I sent you before and I'll briefly talk about them, uh, but you're more than welcome to read it or to ask me more about them. And the third objective is the, I think the most interesting one. I also uh, talked about it a bit in the beginning. It's to uncover the mechanisms of this disorder, both neural and cognitive moderators that actually underlie the symptoms. What do I mean? I mean, not just what happens in the brain at one month after trauma, but also what kind of brain changes happen between let's say one month and six months and how do they relate to what happens uh, in the clinical trajectory at that time point or at future time points. And I will focus on that today. And this is work that we published uh, just a year ago, 2021. So um, I will just wanna briefly mention the first two objectives, the work we've done just in a sentence or two, and then I'll move forward to the, the main part that I will talk about uh, in more detail. So the early classification, just based on TP1, uh, we use the specific method called the triple C, uh, stands for categorize, cluster, and classify. And basically, as I said, we tried uh, to use all the data that we have, which is structural brain measures, functional brain measures, cognitive domains, um, to differentiate between the different PTSD subtypes at the very first time point. Uh, just right after trauma. Our second goal was the prediction of PTSD. So just to give you a quick example, um, one work we focused just on the cognitive domains and we started out of 11 cognitive domains that we had that you can see here. The most important one was the one called cognitive flexibility, 
And specifically, we showed a strong negative correlation, those participants which had increased cognitive flexibility at one month after trauma were the ones that showed more recovery or less PTSD symptoms at 14 months and vice versa. Those with lower cognitive flexibility showed higher PTSD symptoms. Um, in a different sample, we even showed the changing disability, improving this flexibility kind of right after trauma between one month to three months after trauma could actually result in reduction of future symptoms. Um, we also looked at the brain and found one area that a lot of people were talking about the hippocampus, but also one area that I believe we were the first to find or at least to report, uh, an area which is called cavum septum pellucidum, which is kind of a developmental abnormality uh, in the brain. And the combination of both of these abnormalities, the presence of the CSP uh, and lower hippocampal volume together early after trauma, they were the run to predict more severe PTSD symptoms. You can see an example here. And again, uh, it's all published work. So I'll be happy if you wanna hear more, uh, you can read about it. And of course, ask me. And the work I wanna talk to you uh, today in the time that we have left is about the mechanisms of PTSD. Is this work published uh, titled Neural Responsivity to Reward versus Punishment Shortly After Trauma? predicts long-term development of post-traumatic stress symptoms. Um, it was published in Biological Psychiatry uh, and also got some, uh, let's say some more interest in the public, public science uh, domain, science news and neuroscience news and uh, different papers, which was all, also nice. And this work focused on two important domains, called positive and negative valence systems. So what does it even mean? Um, together with what I told you in the first slide of my talk today, uh, there's a shift in psychiatry uh, calling researchers to focus more on processes or domains rather than directly on symptoms. And probably some of you heard about the RDOC initiative uh, proposed by the NIH uh, that basically define five different domains uh, to investigate that could be related to all the different mental disorders that we know. Two of these domains are negative violence and positive violence, and we follow them and focus on them in this work. Um, what is known in PTSD today? So as you might assume, not surprisingly, most of the work in PTSD focus on the negative violence system in the brain uh, showing the different areas in the brain, specifically the amygdala, which is kind of the center of emotions, mainly negative ones, but not only, and salience network of the brain, uh, different regions of the salience network. It was shown that there is hyper-responsivity of these areas in people with PTSD uh, to negative stimuli. When I say negative stimuli, it was both trauma-related stimuli, so let's say if it's a car accident, I'm talking about images of car accidents or videos of car accidents, but also to unrelated stimuli, for example, sad faces or other kind of stimuli that are just negative in general, not related to the trauma. Uh, and the hypothesis is that increased threat processing does, uh, there's an alternation after trauma, the threat processing become more increased and more intense. Uh, and that leads to the symptoms of hyperarousal and intrusion re-experience. If you remember, those are just two out of four clusters that I talked to in the beginning, and they are believed to be related to this hyperactivity of the negative valence system, or in short, I will call it NVS. On the other hand, what I think is very interesting, uh, less attention has been uh, yeah, less attention has been, uh, has been like, there's uh, less work about the positive violence system in PTSD, way less work and way less focus and attention. Uh, the positive violence system or the reward system of the brain includes the ventral striatum and other areas that you can see here. Um, and it's basically how our brain reacts to a positive or rewarding stimuli. It's mainly investigated in depression uh, because obviously people are feeling more depressed and less 
uh, willing to engage in positive activities or positive emotions, but the few works in PTSD that have been done in the recent years also found kind of a decrease of this uh, neural activity of the positive system, positive valence system, the PVS, and the underlying processes here uh, are thought to be decreased reward functioning. Reward functioning is kind of a broad term for anticipation for rewards, for approach behavior towards a reward, and for hedonic responses, or in general, uh, how do I respond when I get a reward? If I have positive emotions, if I don't have positive emotions, and this relates to symptoms that I talked with you about before, both on avoidance, so maybe just trying to avoid going to activities because I don't feel any pleasure from doing them and they're just risky, and also symptoms of anhedonia, which again are more depressive symptoms, but they appear in one of the clusters of PTSD. Um, so what we offered here, uh, kind of just a, our framework or our initial thought was that PTSD can be related not only uh, with alternation in the negative system, but also with alternation in the positive system. And this is just a paper, conceptual paper I really liked by Stein and Paulus from 2009, uh, suggesting that now they're not talking exactly on the positive and negative valence systems, but rather on approach versus avoidance behavior, uh, which can represent both systems. And they say that as individuals, we're somewhere here in between in the circle. We have a specific amount of approach and specific amount of avoidance. It doesn't matter we're different people, but let's say around here. And then after exposure to trauma, specifically in those who develop PTSD, this whole situation, this whole circle is altered, is going up and left, meaning that people are way less, uh, showing way less approach behavior and way more avoidance behavior, uh, regardless to what, what their behaviors were like in the beginning. Um, so this led us to the research goal. We wanted to see what happens in the brain, in the negative valence system and positive valence system throughout PTSD development in this uh, study period of 14 months after trauma um, and see if we, we are right and we think that both systems are involved. One of them is hyperactive, one of them is hypoactive. And to do that, we used a paradigm, uh, which I'll describe to you in the next slide, which is called uh, the domino paradigm. And this is also one of the reasons that now in retrospect, I, I chose uh, to join Ifat Levy's lab uh, that is focusing on decision-making because in the beginning, it, it kind of looks at what's the relationship between PTSD and decision-making. They're not related, but here I will try to today to show you some evidence to why they are very related and relevant. Uh, and this is why I'm trying to combine those words of decision-making and PTSD. Um, so I'll briefly describe you the task and please let me know if you have any questions because this will be important uh, for you to understand the results. So the task was built, um, I'll tell you the focus later. This is the kind of the diagram or figure that describes the task. So a participant uh, came to us, we put him inside the MRI, him or her. Uh, we told the participant that he's going to play a competitive we call it safe or risky domino choice game or SRDC, um, which is kind of a little bit like the, some of you might know the, the regular the physical domino game, but also with an element of uh, either telling the truth or, or lying. So what exactly did they do? Um, so I told the participant that they're playing against me. I was the experimenter. Of course, they were playing uh, against the computer, but they believed at least most of them they were playing against me. They had their own chips presented like that. You can see here all the chips. That was something that we said it's visible only for the player and not for the opponent, which was me. And what they saw is one chip that I had that we called it the master chip. Um, this is how the game began. Um, and then the goal, the goal of the player was to get rid of all of the chips. Uh, if you get rid of all of the chips, you win the game. Uh, if you don't get rid from all of the chips at a certain time, uh, then you lose the game. So in every round, you have a choice. 
you can choose you can choose either to put in a matching card or a matching choice or a non-matching choice. What do I mean by that? So uh, you can see the master chip in this example contains two numbers, six and zero. And then the participants were told that every chip that they have that contains either six or zero is considered a matching chip. So for example, six and one is matching because it has six or zero and five is matching because it has zero. And of course, if someone was identical, some chip was identical, six and zero, it's also considered a matching one. And all the others are non-matching ones. For example, five and four does not include six, does not include zero, and it's a non-matching choice. Of course, we randomized it in a way that participant always had begun with some matching and some non-matching choices. So they chose a card, then the card was uh, put in on the main, here you can see on the main screen here, facing backwards. So I couldn't see, I or the opponent couldn't see the, the card. After the choice, there was a period of anticipation that nothing happened and then the participant were just anticipated to see what am I going to do next, the opponent. And this is very interesting period to look at the brain. And afterwards, there was a decision, we called it show or non-show. Basically, uh, me, the opponent, chose either to reveal the card or not to reveal the card, to flip the chip or not to flip the chip. And based on the two different choices, matching and non-matching, and based on the two different choices that I made to show or not to show, we ended up with four different outcomes, either reward or punishment. So let's go through one by one just to make sure we understand. So let's say the player chose a matching card. So he chose a matching card. It was put in facing down on the board, anticipation phase. And then let's say I chose to reveal the card. So I flipped over the card and that was a main reward outcome. Why? Because then the player got rid of the card that he had put on, let's say the six and one card, but also uh, he got rid of one extra chip just randomly from his hand. So. He got rid of two chips, which again, I remind you, it's good because the whole uh, purpose of the game was to get rid from get rid of all of the chips. Let's say the participant chose a matching choice, but I didn't uh, reveal the card. I didn't choose to flip it. So we call it a no-show, and this is a relative punishment. Why? Because in that situation, the player does get rid or disposes uh, one chip, but is not uh, losing two chips, which he could have been uh, disposing in the case that I would show it. And the situation of the non-matching is exactly the opposite. If the participant chose a non-matching choice, of course, he kind of was hoping that I wouldn't reveal his choice. If I indeed I wouldn't reveal the choice, that would be a relative reward because the participant will, uh, would lose that one card, even though it was a non-matching one. He got rid of it. Let's say you can think about he lied to me and I didn't catch him lying to me. Uh, but the other scenario was that he lied to me, put a non-matching card, and uh, I revealed it, and that was the main punishment of the task. So we got both the card back, the chip back to his hand, and got another more chip from the stack here. So we got two chips instead of getting rid of one chip. So you can see we have two rewards and two punishments, and in this task we focused behaviorally on the decision making. So a simple choice of match and non-match. Of course, participants had to use both choices and this scenario was ongoing. So what you see here, you have the seconds, but there was the choice, anticipation, outcome. Then another choice, another anticipation, another outcome. It was a very dynamic ongoing game played for 15 minutes. Uh, and behaviorally, again, we looked at the uh, Decision making, how many non matching choices you took, for example, out of the whole choices. And in the brain, we looked mostly on this stage of the response to an outcome. How does the brain react to rewards versus how does the brain react to punishments? And as I told you in the beginning, we focus on specific areas and specific systems. So the amygdala here in red was a representative of the negative violence system, the NVS. And the ventral striatum over here in green was the representative of the positive valence system, PVS. Um, we didn't look just on brain activations, but also on brain functional connectivity with different of those areas with different parts of the prefrontal cortex, uh, specifically the lateral 
orbitofrontal cortex and the ventral medial orbitofrontal cortex. Any questions regarding the paradigm? Feel free to ask anything. Any other people are making questions? How long did you say the anticipation period is? So the anticipation was, it was kind of uh, with a jitter, but it was usually four and a half seconds plus minus one and a half seconds. So it was between three to six seconds okay. was kind of the decision making. So in the decision making, they had four seconds to think about what decision they can make and then up to 12 seconds to actually perform the decision. So what they did is they, in the MRI, they had, uh, they had a box, a response box, and they had to move the cursor in order to choose the specific chip they wanted, right and left, and then press enter. Uh, they had to do it in 12 seconds, which was quite reasonable. Then they had anticipation, as I said. And then the response to outcome was also between three to six seconds with an average of 4.5. Um, yeah, the whole game was 14 or 15 minutes, as I said. So it was an average of between three to four rounds played for each participant. So a round meaning like a game that you uh, either win or lose. Any other questions for you guys? All right, I think we're good. Perfect. So uh, it was important to me to kind of give you all the details on that. Now let's look at the results after all the explanations. So I told you about the, the let's say the main goal that we had, the main aim, but we divided it to three different, uh, the, the main hypothesis we divided it uh, or the main goal divided to three different aims. So first of all, we just looked at the first time point, wanted to look at those two systems, uh, both behaviorally and neurally, and see how they relate to PTSD severity at one month after trauma. Then we wanted to look at the prediction of those indices to development of PTSD afterwards, and also to look in the combined effects of both systems together, not just separately. Uh, our hypothesis based on a little bit of uh, previous research was that more severe PTSD at all time points uh, would be associated with behaviorally with increased risk-taking behavior, choosing more non-matching choices com uh, as a percentage of all choices, and also with increased activity of the negative valence system as reflected by the amygdala and reduced activity of the reward or positive system as reflected by decreased ventral striatum activity and connectivity. That was the general hypothesis. And now I'm gonna show you the results. Uh, some of them matched the hypothesis and some did not, as, as always. Um, so just looking at the first time point, just one month after trauma, behaviorally, uh, you can see the results here. So if you look uh, at the scatter plot here, you can see the correlation between PTSD severity and risky choice index. The risky choice index is a very simple measure uh, that we calculated for each participant, which is just taking the non-matching choices or non-matching chips divided by all the choices you made. So it could be anything between zero to one. Uh, those numbers here, they're just standard values, so they don't mean anything, but Basically, the higher risky choice index you had, meaning you chose uh, more non-matching chips. And as we hypothesized, uh, oh wait, let me see maybe. This this was of course, I, I uh, this of course is a wrong error. I meant to say the hypothesis was that less risk-taking behavior would be associated with PTSD. And that is indeed what we got. So we see that participants that took less risky choices had more severe PTSD symptoms. This is just in one month after trauma and participant that had uh, more risk tendency or more uh, tendency to chose non-matching chips had less severe PTSD symptoms. We can also see that if we uh, kind of divide the participants at the first time point into two, about 100 participants with PTSD uh, showed about 40% of risk taking. So they chose non-matching chips about 40% of the time, whereas the people without PTSD chose uh, risky choices uh, about 50% of the time. And by the way, I didn't tell you, but the actual choices to reveal or not reveal, the show or no show was completely random. It happened 50% of the time. So actually um, 
I, I would say the best strategy was also to choose matching and non-matching about 50% of the time. There's no one strategy to win because it's random, but you do need to choose both matching and non-matching in order to have better chances to win. Um, so this is on the behavioral level. Let's look at the brain. So here in figure A and B, you can see the negative uh, valence system in the brain, the amygdala uh, in red, and the ventral striatum representing the positive in green. Um, again, y-axis is the symptoms, x-axis is the activation. And when I talk about the neural activation, it's always in the contrast of when you receive punishment versus reward, or when you receive reward versus punishment. So if we look right here on the amygdala, on the negative valence system, we see a correlation, positive correlation between the amygdala activation, both left and right uh, sides to PTSD severity, meaning that more amygdala activation when receiving punishment versus when receiving reward meant that the participant had more severe PTSD symptoms. However, we do not see any correlation with the positive valence system at one month after trauma, meaning there's no relation between left or right ventral striatum activation when receiving reward versus receiving punishment to PTSD severity and this time point. So to conclude that, we see in the one month after trauma, very early time point one, we see mainly a correlation between the negative valence system of the brain and between the behavior. Uh, and even more strongly, we also find which examine all the connectivity patterns. And we also find a positive correlation between the amygdala connectivity with the orbitofrontal cortex, stronger connectivity uh, when receiving punishment versus award was also correlated with more severe PTSD symptoms. Now, uh, more interesting, let's look at those neural measures at the first time point compared to uh, symptoms at the second and third time point. So uh, contrary to our hypothesis, we did not find any relation between the behavior, the early behavior symptoms later on at six or 14 months, uh, but we didn't find very interesting uh, neural associations. So we can see kind of an opposite, uh, opposite pattern. We see that more strong amygdala activity to punishment versus reward at one month after trauma was indeed associated with more severe PTSD symptoms at 14 months. So a year later, a bit more than a year later, this is a prediction. Unlike the previous graphs I showed you, which is the same time point, here you look at activation at time one and uh, severity at time three. So more amygdala, more PTSD, and the opposite is less ventral striatum, less reward activation during reward versus punishment led uh, to more severe PTSD. So a combination of both increased amygdala and decreased ventral striatum, both of them were correlated with PTSD. And importantly, was also related to specific uh, PTSD symptoms, uh, which I can show you here. So the amygdala correlation of the negative uh, valence system was specifically correlated with intrusion and hyperarousal symptoms, you can see here. And uh, decreased activity of the reward system was specifically associated with avoidance symptoms. These are the four clusters that I showed you in the beginning that you can see also on the bars here. So we see kind of interesting differentiation. They're both related to PTSD, but also to different symptoms. And again, we got this pattern also with the connectivity of the ventral striatum, decreased connectivity was correlated with um, more PTSD. So the last stage was to actually try and look at the combined contribution of them or the combined effects, or basically asking um, if we put if we put both of those systems together as predictors for PTSD severity, which one is more important than the other? We use some uh, method called CHOP, which is explainable machine learning. Uh, but without getting into too much details, you can see over here, this is the important measures. So the two most uh, important measures for uh, the prediction of PTSD symptoms in the endpoint at 14 months after trauma was the connectivity of the ventral striatum and the activity of the ventral striatum. And those two were more important to the prediction rather than or compared to the amygdala activation. So the two indices of the positive valence system were more important to the prediction 
um, or let's say gave more information about how severe your PTSD symptoms compared to the negative valence system. So to sum up the results um, in kind of a way that we can understand the story, we saw that shortly after trauma, at one month of the trauma, there was a decrease in risky choices and an increase in the amygdala or negative valence system activation to punishment. Uh, this was also found in previous work and maybe can hint us that this hyperactive negative valence system is something that is very initial, uh, very early, and might even be something that we have before the trauma that could serve as a predisposing risk factor. On the other hand, when looking at what predicted the development of PTSD, we found both decreased activity of the reward system and increased activity of the negative system, both of them predicting uh, PTSD symptoms. But uh, this can also hint us that this positive valence system could be something that is changing throughout time and could be more of the consequences of the exposure rather than a predisposing risk factor. Uh, when we look to the specific cluster, so again, it's very important to notice that the different brain regions and connectivity patterns were related to different uh, processes or different symptoms, which could lead to different treatments. Let's say people who experience more avoidance uh, might be related to re reward system and people who experience more re-experiencing an arousal or hyperarousal could be treated via the negative system. And we also showed that the positive valence system was more important, at least in our sample, uh, we can hypothesize it that the actual role of this positive system is to promote resilience and recovery from traumatic stress, hopefully leading to recovery from PTSD. Um, and yeah, it's another uh, thing that I will skip, but related to cognitive flexibility, which I told you we found. So a connection between this flexibility to the risk choice uh, behavior that we saw. So just to conclude the take home message from this specific work I showed you, was that in treatment for PTSD, whether it's psychological or any other treatment, we should look at both systems, at the negative and positive systems, both behaviorally, but also in the brain. Um, possibly enhancing the reward system could be more beneficial for some individuals than reducing the negative system. And also this reward system received way less attention, so it could be more explored in a new therapeutic way. Um, just to sum up is the last two slides that I have regarding future directions, uh, and then I'll be happy to answer questions. Um, so what ha what's happening now in, in Tel Aviv, uh, in my previous lab, is kind of a follow-up study, uh, which is aiming to personalize stress psychopathology. So we're trying to develop a risk prediction model using statist statistical and computational methods based on my data set, and then to collect a whole new data set now and another whole study of five years, uh, which would also collect other measures, including genetics and epigenetics, uh, and try to see if we get the same results. Because as you know, uh, one study will never tell you the whole truth and we need to validate and replicate the findings in order to see that they are actually real. Um, so that's one direction. And the second, second direction, which is mostly uh, what I'm doing now at Yale, again, combining the words of decision-making neuroscience uh, with Professor Ifat Levy and the word of clinical PTSD with Professor Ilan paz um, trying to focus on several different topics. Uh, one thing, which is my current main project, is working on neural computation of anxiety and PTSD. So a little bit... Uh, based on the work I showed you now, what kind of alternation we see in learning processes, in decision-making processes, and in memory processes that are related to PTSD and anxiety. And also, are all these processes are specifically just for reward learning or also for punishment learning, or maybe both of them. I'm also working, uh, doing some work on the reward system in PTSD and in veterans to kind of focus more on the reward system, which has been less investigated and see if we can treat PTSD using that system. Uh, and a third project uh, examining decision-making, specifically risk and ambiguity, which is a lot of the focus of Professor Levy's work, um, but specifically in people with anxiety. 
Um, just to finish, I want to say that uh, everything I presented here, of course, was a work of many, many people. Uh, you can see all the names here, collaboration of many places, funding from different places, and mostly uh, amazing research team, uh, which has done a lot of work. Uh, um, and I just helped <laughs> managing it, and I'm presenting you the results, which is mainly uh, work that they have done. And of course, uh, thank you for inviting me and for your attention. Uh, thank you very much. Wow, thank you very much. enormous and important um, undertaking. Um, first, I'd like to open the floor to the uh, people who are on, uh, on Zoom and see if they have any questions, which uh, I see we have at least one former student um, and some of the students who presented your papers to class. So I wanted to see if there were any uh, initial questions. And Sarah, I don't know if you usually include the questions in the recording or if you wanted to it's up to you. I mean, it's nice to record the questions, but I also understand if anybody doesn't want to be recorded, I can uh, turn it off for them. If, if anybody objects to being recorded, just say so before they ask the question. But otherwise, I think it's nice to, because somebody might ask a great question that someone watching the recording would like. Excellent. Okay. Um, so is there any, any virtual people that wanted to ask a question? Virtual people seem quiet. Um, how about any real life people? Do you have any questions? I have several questions that I wrote down. Maybe they'll think of their questions while. Um, so we mentioned the uh, epigenetics part, which seems like a really important thing to try and sort of track over time, which could kind of give you some insight into mechanisms. And have there been any studies done to date on epigenetic changes with PTSD? Yeah, so it's a great question. Um, so as far as I know, uh, to date, there hasn't been any studies in epigenetics specifically not in humans. Uh, there is some research in, uh, in animal models. So usually in pe people use animal models of fear learning and fear extinction, uh, which is of course not exactly parallel to PTSD in humans, but uh, we're hoping that this, this new studies that following indeed, for those of you who, are, who don't know, I'll just specify that this so we have genetics, which is basically the DNA, uh, which is the material that we have each individual individual, and we carry throughout our lifetime. We got it from our parents and we're gonna transfer it to the next generation. But epigenetics is more of a field of genetic changes throughout time. So all the different biological processes of uh, materialization and uh, processing of RNA and stuff like that, that is actually stuff that changing in individuals throughout our lifetime. And that is also the reason why some of the DNA, some of the genes are expressed and some are not. So uh, we actually think in, in this new study, we're actually gonna trace it in three different time points, exactly the same ones at one month, six months and 14, uh, in order to see changes over time in the epigenetics. And of course, for the genetics, it's enough uh, to just study one time point and yeah, there's not much known about it. So anything will be interesting in that sense. Yeah, it seems like a lot of um, unknowns related to that that would be really important to look into. And we talked about in class how much we like this sort of multi, uh, you know, multi approach between the anatomy, the function, the, the cognitive, all of these different kind of tools applied to it. Um, I'll give my audience a chance to ask any questions while I'm consulting my notes for my next question. I wanted to make a point about all of your future directions can each be in themselves another huge, rich talk. So, um, you know, the things that you mentioned at the end. Um, what do you think about the, uh, 
you know, potential about just really trying to, uh, are there any ways to kind of promote cognitive flexibility as a prevention for PTSD, um, particularly in populations that might be likely to have a high risk for PTSD, you know, veteran, you know, people in the military and things like that. Yeah, again, great question. And uh, I did not show, show it in this lecture because uh, I can talk to you for hours about it, but in the paper of the cognitive flexibility, uh, we actually show that in a different sample, an independent sample, uh, where people had a training of, I think, between 30 to 35 days, uh, each day they had to play this kind of uh, cognitive games, um, I think between half an hour to one hour every day for 30 days, as I said. And we do see, first of all, just in the cognitive flexibility level, we do see changes, some people improved, uh, and it was divided into two groups of treatment versus control. So the treatment group indeed show improvement in flexibility compared to another group who just had like regular games, uh, not targeted at, uh, at different flexibility domains. And interestingly, we showed that the group that showed improvement in flexibility, uh, it was a time frame of between one month to three months after trauma, they showed sub subsequent reduction in symptoms between three months to six months after trauma. Uh, so we definitely think that the mechanism of imp improving flexibility early after trauma could help reduce symptoms. And I, I would say in general, uh, all the interventions that are being done in the acute stage, you know, in the first weeks, the first month, uh, even six months, like the, the first year after trauma, they are the one that we know nowadays they are working, they are more efficient. We still don't know every all the answers and what will be, but just compared to people that would only go to treatment after, you know, five years of PTSD, whatever we will try to do, either pharmacological or psychological, it will be very hard kind of to... Uh, recover from that. I mean, people could learn how to decrease some of the symptoms, but again, the, the real dynamics in this disorder happens in the first year. So whatever we can do as early as possible, and that's also a message for, you know, people in the audience and people that, you know, if someone experienced a trauma and, you know, have any symptoms, the sooner the better uh, to work on that. And, you know, you mentioned military population, which we don't, did not study in this uh in this temple, but we of course have a lot of studies. A lot of times we know that soldiers are kind of feeling ashamed that they have PTSD symptoms, especially if you know their friends died in a battle or severely injured and they think, well, I just have some nightmares, whatever. It's not something, you know, to consult with. So I hope now that this attitude is changing. And I know at least in the Israeli army and I think also in the American army, there is much more awareness to the mental health and hopefully uh, we will be able to both treat people, but also even to identify people. So if talking about flexibility, maybe people with lower flexibility maybe shouldn't be in the combat zone, you know, uh, and people with higher flexibility can go there. So those are the two aims uh, to try, as I said, to try to first of all identify who is at risk, and second of all, to try and help those at risk after uh, exposure for trauma. Yeah, exactly what I was thinking, kind of the prediction and prevention sort of facets of trying to think through things. And maybe those, you know, flexibility tasks that you did could always be a way to keep yourself tuned up with cognitive flexibility and make you more resilient to something when it happens. Um, I wanted to bring up something else we talked about in class in um, lectures that I saw about PTSD a long time ago. But it's been um, sort of a uh, dogma that if you had had a life where you hadn't had very much trauma at all or, or very much kind of worldly experience, you were more vulnerable to getting PTSD um, from an experience in the military than someone who maybe had grown up with more uh, a varied life experience or something like that. Is that something that you that? that is still talked about in PTSD or that you found in your work? Uh, just to make sure I heard you said, you talked about the difference between 
being lonely while experiencing the trauma to being with other people? Was that a question? No, the question was, and this might be hard for you to answer because your work was all done in Tel Aviv, which is very cosmopolitan, but the, um, the talk I saw was about the U.S. military and talking about soldiers who came from, let's say, a super small town, they hadn't really had, you know, maybe grew up on a farm or something like that, which is people who grow up in the city, and someone who had led what we might call like a sheltered life was more, uh, it was more at risk for developing PTSD than someone from a, a big city or something like that. That's a super rough stereotype, but I thought of it almost as more of having like a more diversity of life experience might itself be a, um, a buffer against PTSD. Yeah, definitely. So, um... Indeed, there are a lot of, uh, you know, even demographic or kind of variables that we know that affect uh, the risk for PTSD. So, as you said, could also be related to where you live, if it's in a remote uh, place or in a big city. So, for example, level of education is a predictor uh, for risk. So people with more education are more resilient or could show more recovery. Even stuff such as uh, income of the family, you know, uh, uh, like what kind of social demographic uh, class you're coming for as a predictor. Um, and indeed, it's, that's why kind of what I'm doing now, uh, I'm hoping to expand my research to U.S. veterans, first of all, because they are way more diverse than what we have in Israel. So everything has advantages and disadvantages, the good thing of... Uh, studying a specific population like ours in Tel Aviv uh, is that we have less noise and we can focus more, we can see the differences more clearly, but the disadvantage is that we want to generalize it to treatment or something that would work not only in Tel Aviv. Um, so now focusing on uh, US veterans, of course, we will try to collect, now that you said that it will be important to collect data also of where they, where they're originally from or where they are living currently while they're in uh, while they're in the army and look at differences. And uh, yeah, I think indeed that the main point in the end, we want all the findings and I said it in the end, but it's important to, to say it again, um, never believe in like just one study or one article, not even if it's my article, uh, it's important to be very critical. Uh, in the end, we don't. Our goal is not to publish papers, but to help people. And we have to find everything at least in two or three different samples. And we have to do multiple tests to verify it. It's the connection between the brain and PTSD is not simple. We know it's not one area and it's not one uh, brain function. So I think now now the science is also going. Uh, going in the direction of more large scale studies. Uh, so there's one study that started about two years after ours. Uh, it's called the Aurora study. And I think it's, uh, I think it's from 22 different emergency room, rooms in, across the states, uh, not all across the states, but at least from several different states. So they're kind of doing similar stuff to what we did just from different, instead of one emergency department, looking at 22 different emergency department. Again, it increased the generalizability. That's a very big advantage. The disadvantage is that it's, it's hard to, to uh, find results because there's a lot of differences between the different sites, even between the different MRI machines. Uh, maybe the procedure, you know, even the clinician that is doing the interview could be different from side to side. So we, you just have to account for a lot of difference. But uh, I do believe it's a very important and that's the, the way we should continue going. And actually, since I came here to Yale, I was very lucky uh, uh, throughout the connection that uh, my supervisor have. I kind of made connection with those people of the Aurora study and we were talking about uh, merging the data together and looking at stuff that we can find in both samples. So I look forward to it and uh, hope for my next lecture I could bring you more results from that. Super, just one uh, comment about that. I really like about your study protocol, how it was so comprehensive and 
you know, we really need these kind of multi-center studies that use the same protocol so we can merge merge data. And you know, maybe every single variable is a big for every population, but at least if you have a big protocol scoped out, then you can kind of put the pieces together like that. Um, I'll give everybody a chance for uh, my online people or my real life people to ask any questions about anything in the talk or a Fulbright or graduate school at Yale, going to visit Tel Aviv. Um, you could ask if you have any questions for we'll the uh, people who are did you hear that? Can you be a little louder, Ellie? I didn't hear you. Yeah, yeah like, um, I was curious about if there's a way that PTSD in children at all. Oh, um, Ellie asked if you looked at PTSD in children at all. Um, so I, I specifically didn't do any studies, uh, but there are uh, people that are looking at that. There are two different kind of uh, studies. There are, there are uh, people which have chronic PTSD from events that happened in the childhood, for example, sexual abuse uh, of some of the times by the parents or family members, and then they develop PTSD uh, later in life. So they actually study adults that their trauma was in the childhood. Uh, I don't think there's a lot of research in humans, in, in children, maybe a little bit in adolescents. Uh, more, I think, from, from ethical reasons that there's less studies uh, of children, but also, you know, for some of the symptoms that I described, um, you know, such as depression and anxiety and thoughts and stuff like that, you at least need to be at a certain age to kind of even understand how you feel about emotions or how you think or something like that. But it's a very interesting question uh, to look at it in the de developmental perspective. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know too much work that has been done on that just work about uh, PTSD stemming from childhood traumas, which is, uh, by the way, very also a very uh, chronic condition that is very hard to change. Uh, as I said before, more time that is passing through is harder to treat, and those people experience the trauma as kids. Um, unfortunately, we don't have good enough treatments for them. Thank you. Other questions from about any topic from anyone, anywhere. And oh, thank you for posting your email in the chat in case people want to follow up with additional questions. Um, yeah, feel free because uh, sometimes uh, I also hear lectures and then two days I have a great idea and I say, oh, I should have asked that. So uh, feel free send me at any time. Uh, I'll be happy to talk and sometimes I get really good ideas from people. So it's also helpful. Excellent. Yeah, I wanted to thank you. We had a great discussion in class about your papers and congratulations again on your Fulbright and your work. We look forward to following it and uh, help me to thank Dr. Benzion again. <laughs>